And good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Hope you'll go to my website, donkpreston.com, BibleProphecy.com. Check out the hundreds, no, check out the thousands of articles that are on there, totally free for your reading. Uh, there are many, many, many uh, resources available there. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, books, I've written something like 32, 33 books and uh, DVDs. I recently finished a very special 21 series DVD uh, video series on when did or will the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9 come to an end. I love the material. Uh, the response to it so far has been absolutely excellent. And people are telling me it answers questions I've had on Daniel chapter 9. Uh, they've had these questions for years and years. So avail yourself of that. Again, uh, 21 lessons. And it's available for on disk. It's available on flash drive. It is available for, uh, you know, MP3. Or it is available on download at a reduced price, obviously. So please take, take advantage of that material uh, and the offerings that are there. Uh, people contact me all the time. They're asking me this question that, and that, that question. And believe you me, I, I do my very best to answer pers personally, but sometimes the correspondence load gets to be kind of, you know, overwhelming. And so I don't always get the opportunity to answer. And then sometimes, listen, sometimes people, they'll contact me and say, I've sent you three emails. Why in the world haven't you all uh, answered me? Well, you know, uh, number one, workload. Number two, I don't always get emails that have been sent to me. I don't know what to tell you. I have had people contact me, finally call me on the phone and say, look, I have sent you four or five emails and I know you're terribly busy, but, and so I go look in my email folder, there's nothing there. And so I don't know what's happening. Uh, all I can do is apologize for that and to say, I do my best to keep up with my email load. I really do. But if I don't get your email, guess what? I don't get your email. <laughs> uh, and by the way, I had to change my email provider good long while back. Unfortunately, there's still some locations out there that have my old email address of dkpret at cable1. That's wrong. Don't ever use that email address. I will never, ever get the email. Okay? So it's Don K. Preston at gmail.com. That's my correct email. Uh, so you can contact contact me through my website, donkpreston.com or bibleprophecy.com or eschatology.org. All right, moving right on, <clears throat> right along now. I, I'm taking the time to share with you the fact Joel 2 and 3 is directly parallel to and is the source for Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. Joel said in the last days and in the day of the Lord, he would gather all nations, Yahweh would gather all nations to judgment. And he said, I will enter into judgment with them there. <clears throat> and it would be in that day, the Lord said, the sun would be darkened, the moon would not give its light, the stars of heaven would fall from the sky, the powers of the heaven would be shaken to add another text to that. What I shared with you yesterday is the fact that this language of decreation is the common language of the Old Testament. It is used any time, and basically, pardon me, almost every time that Yahweh described his actions to use one nation over here to judge this nation over here. And when he used this nation to judge this nation, this nation was called the, the tools or the instruments of his wrath. Isaiah chapter 10, 5 and following, O Assyrian, the rod in my hand, the wrath, the staff of my anger. Well, Assyria was not a literal rod, was not a literal staff. And Assyria didn't believe that they were Yahweh's instrument. That's what Isaiah 10, 5 and following says. They do not believe that they were Yahweh's instrument. 
All they wanted to do was conquer nations and destroy them, to tread them down in the mud. Yahweh said, nah, they're my instrument. They're the tool of my hand. So, yesterday I shared Isaiah chapter 13 with you. Uh, please go back and watch that. <clears throat> Another fantastic prophecy. This one is so significant because it foretold the ultimate day of the Lord. And the reason I know that is because the result of the day of the Lord of Isaiah chapter 24 would be the kingdom. Yahweh ruling on Mount Zion gloriously at the time of the Messianic banquet at the time of the resurrection. So you see, Isaiah chapter 24 is an extremely important passage. So I hope you have your Bible. I'm going to re begin reading Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste. He distorts its surfaces and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. See, nobody's exempt. Everybody is the object of this day of the Lord. Some for good, some for not good. But everybody would be involved. For the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is defiled under its inhabitants. Now watch this. Because here's the reason the earth is going to be destroyed in this prophecy. Here's the reason for the people of the earth to be scattered abroad. Now, by the way, in the day of the Lord of traditional eschatology, would it do any good for men to be scattered abroad? to run from the day of the Lord? Nah, not even a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> once again, the earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because here's the reason for this judgment that was coming. Here's the reason the earth and its inhabitants therein would mourn and would languish because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Now, you know, folks, we have a real problem here. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of literal, physical heaven and earth being destroyed because of men violating the gospel? I've never heard that. I never taught that. Now, have, have I heard ministers, have I read commentators who say that in the last days, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being, and being deceived? And it would be during that time of evil that the Lord would come? Certainly I have. Have I ever heard anyone say the reason for the destruction would be the wickedness of man? No, I haven't. Maybe I missed it, okay? Maybe you've heard that. I haven't. But that's not really the issue. The issue is they, they, have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Now, <clears throat> what, from the perspective of Isaiah, what was the laws? What was the law? From Isaiah's perspective, what was the law? It 
was it the gospel of Christ? It was Torah. It was the Tanakh. Furthermore, they have broken the everlasting covenant. Well, some commentators say, well, you see, that everlasting covenant, that's the Noahic covenant in which after the flood, God said, I will never again destroy every, every living creature as I have done. I'm going to put my bow in the sky as a sign of my covenant, never again to destroy every living creature. Well, here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. That was a unilateral covenant. God simply said, here's my oath, here's my covenant, here's my promise. As a unilateral covenant, mankind could not violate that covenant. It's God's word. It's unconditional. Man could never violate or transgress the Noahic covenant of Genesis chapter 6 and following. And yet, this destruction of heaven and earth in Isaiah chapter 24 would be as a result of man transgressing the eternal covenant. Well, here's the deal. When we look at the parallel passages, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 5, and those parallel passages are Hosea 8 and Hosea 6, 6 to 7. And, and again, these are parallel passages. It is Israel that violated the law of Moses. That was the everlasting covenant that they violated. Furthermore, this is absolutely demonstrated because this judgment was going to come on the people. In the Hebrew, it's the people. Okay, from Israel's perspective, who was, quote, the people, unquote. They only referred to themselves as the people. And this people <clears throat> were citizens of the city, unquote, that sat in the midst of the land. So let me ask you a question. From Isaiah's perspective, who were the people who dwelt in the, in the city that sat in the midst of the land? Well, according to Ezekiel chapter 5, 8 and 9, it was Jerusalem that set it in the midst of the earth. Furthermore, the people, the people of the sin, inhabited this city of sin, and it was later called the city of confusion. In Isaiah chapter 29, which is very parallel to chapter 24, the Lord said, Woe unto you, Ariel, the city of confusion. Well, who, who was Ariel? It was Jerusalem. So we have here the prediction of the destruction of heaven and earth. And yes, let me read that. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 9, uh, 19, excuse me. Uh, and I'll begin with verse 18. It shall be that the one who flees from the noise of the, uh, of the fear shall fall into the pit. The one who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth are shaken. Hey, you know what? That's a flood. Ooh. Ooh. What happened to God's promise? I will never again destroy every living creature as I have done. Huh. Here's a flood. This is flood imagery. Well, anyway, got to hurry here. The earth is violently broken. The earth is, is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgressions shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not rise again. So once again, this is the destruction of heaven and earth as a result of the sin of the people. <clears throat> the sin of violating Torah. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of anyone ever teaching that the literal, physical heaven and earth 
would be destroyed because of Israel's violation of the law of Moses? Uh, pardon me. No, you haven't. Nobody teaches that. Now watch. Here's the thing. This is, this is part of the background for Matthew chapter 25. How do I know that? Well, at this destruction of heaven and earth, which we are told is Matthew chapter 25, 31, even though the destruction of heaven and earth is not named, it's nonetheless the time of Joel chapter 3 when the sun would be dark and the earth, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So at that time is the time of the kingdom. Enter thou into the joys of the kingdom, prepared for you from the foundations of the world. In Isaiah chapter 24, what happens at this day of the Lord? Oh, the moon will be disgraced, the sun ashamed, and the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. You want to tell me that's not Matthew chapter 25? 31 and following? There you've got the destruction of heaven and earth. You've got Yahweh ruling gloriously in the kingdom, which is Matthew 25. Then, then shall he that is Christ sit on the throne of his glory. Folks, these are the same thing. And Jesus said he was coming in his kingdom before every one of that generation died. Matthew 16, 27, and 28. But look, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you so much for joining me for this morning's morning musings. Don't forget, tomorrow we will pick up on our study of why N.T. Wright is wrong on the redemption of creation. I'll see you there.